being haunted by a shadow man, but honestly, it feels more like I'm being stalked by it. Whatever you want to refer to it as, I've been dealing with it for years now. The first time I saw it was at an Outback Steakhouse in Texas. I was there with my family for a birthday dinner, and it was just standing in the corner by the entrance door. Nobody else seemed to see it, and I wasn't even really sure what I was seeing. It stood there, darker than dark, like a shadow's shadow or a void of space or something. There I sat, with my family, watching this entity hover in place, and I could have sworn it was looking right at me. I asked my sister if she saw it. She looked around, but saw nothing. Why was I the only one that could see it? I whispered to my sister about what I was seeing, careful not to let the rest of my family hear. I didn't want to be ridiculed. I continued to watch this thing, completely frightened by it, especially since I had no idea what it was at the time. It eventually faded away or dissipated or something, and the moment it was gone, I felt a lot better, like this weight was lifted off of my chest and shoulders. Believe me though, I kept an eye on that area the rest of dinner. Later that night, I drove back to my apartment, thinking about the shadow man or whatever the hell it was. I thought about it the whole way there, and when I got inside, I immediately jumped on the computer and searched for other encounters. I read about the hat man and shadow people, and none of that made me feel any better. Although the thought of actually having had an encounter was kind of cool, even I could admit that. But this feeling of intrigue, it didn't last very long. I went to bed eventually and woke up while it was still dark outside, and that shadow person was in my bedroom. I think I actually died from fright for a second because I was so scared. Why did my fiancé pick this weekend to go out of town? I needed him to tell me it was okay. This thing was just standing there, a few feet into our bedroom, between my bed and the door. Even as dark as the room was, and it was pretty dark because we have those light blocking curtains, this thing was even darker than that. I screamed in fright and rolled out of bed on the other side, trying to keep as much distance from this thing as I could. My heart was pounding so loud I could hear it in my ears, and I was shaking uncontrollably. I had nowhere to go, and nowhere to run. That thing was blocking my exit, the only way out of that bedroom. I thought about trying to climb out of the window, but we were on the second floor and there was no fire escape. Hell, it was just a straight shot down. But still, I contemplated that because I wanted to get away from that thing so desperately. I asked it what it wanted, but I got no reply. It just stood there, facing me. I could see a bit of red in this thing, right where your eyes could be, and I assumed the glowing redness was that thing's eyes. That dread hit me like a ton of bricks. Nothing good could come out of having red eyes. And I also got the distinct smell of sulfur or ozone or something. I have no idea how long it was there with me, or how long I was standing there on the other side of the bed trembling in fear, but I closed my eyes, and when I opened them, it was gone. I called my fiancé and told him all about what I had seen. Then I called my sister and ended up staying with her the next three days until he got home. Luckily for me though, both of them believed me. The part that was the scariest though, as I stayed there for those three days just thinking about that encounter, was how long that thing could have been standing there watching me before I even woke up. A few months passed and I had no other encounters with it. Josh, my fiance, got a really good job offer and we ended up moving from Texas to Colorado. Before we moved though, I saw it again. But let me go back a few days. One day, while I was packing, I started to get extremely cold, like shivering cold. This was odd since it was June, and if anyone is listening from Texas, you know I shouldn't be shivering at this point. I went outside to warm up, 
and that did the trick, but the moment I went back inside, I was freezing again. And then a few days later is when I had my third encounter. This time, I was at the grocery store of all places, and I happened to look up and see it standing in the middle of the aisle, staring at me again. I left my basket and got the hell out of that store. I told Josh about what I'd saw again, and we went to church that Sunday, prayed and talked to my sister. She prayed with us too. The rest of our move went off without a hitch. We settled into our new apartment, had a small wedding, and enjoyed the cooler weather as fall set in. I pushed the thought of all that Shadow Man crap out of my head, and it seemed that maybe whatever was haunting me was attached to that apartment, or that area, because the moment we moved from Texas to Colorado, I felt completely fine. But I was wrong. All that was just wishful thinking. One night, about five months after we moved, I woke up unable to breathe very well, like something was on my chest. I mean, it actually felt like someone was sitting right on top of my chest. It wasn't an asthma attack or congestion or bronchitis or any kind of shit like that. It felt like someone was actually there putting pressure onto my chest. I tried to call for Josh, but I couldn't talk at all, and I was absolutely freezing. I heard whispers, but had no idea what they were saying. I was terrified. Eventually, I caught my breath and I leapt out of bed, screaming at the top of my lungs in a blind panic. Josh bolted up too, and I fell into his arms sobbing. The next day, we went to our church and talked with our priest. We invited him over for dinner and he came to pray with us in the house. Praying with him made me feel immensely better. This feeling of peace spread through the entire place, and I felt this weight lift from my chest again. Weeks went by and I felt no cold spots, no night terrors, I didn't even see the shadow man. I even found out that I was pregnant. I was overjoyed. Josh and I went to our first ultrasound. Everything checked out perfectly and I was so happy I started crying. Unfortunately this joy was shattered by another encounter with that damn shadow man. It started when we got home. I smelled that familiar ozone smell. I told Josh that I knew he was going to make an appearance soon, and he looked more worried than ever. It wasn't just about us anymore with this thing. It could haunt us all it wanted. I didn't care. But now, this was about our baby too. Josh suggested we go out of town for the weekend and try to get away, but I knew this wasn't going to help. It would follow us wherever we went. I think I cried for a few hours after that, worried about myself and Josh, but more worried that something would happen to this precious life that was growing inside of me. The more I thought about my baby, the angrier I became at this thing, and this fueled my fire to stop this haunting bullshit. I went back to the church and prayed and prayed, met with our father again and prayed more with him. This time though it didn't seem to help. I felt the cold spots when I got home again and the next day I saw the shadow man again. This time it was in the living room. I didn't give it the chance to scare me though. This time I got up and left the apartment. I waited until Josh got home from work before I returned and spent the rest of the night curled up in his arms, trying to figure out what to do about our situation. Josh got on the computer and found a medium that we met with a couple days later and she confirmed that an entity had attached itself to me. She's asked me to leave her name out of this email, so I'm going to do that to honor her. She wanted to commune with this thing though and try to break the hold, but I was too scared to make contact with it. She agreed that it might cause it to get violent, something I couldn't risk and just resigned myself to the fact that this thing might be in my life for quite some time. I tried best to stay happy and hopeful, concentrated on my pregnancy and prepared for the baby. We took those pregnancy and birth classes and everything seemed like normal, but 
Then, once again, I encountered the Shadow Man. At this part, I was pretty far along. Almost eight months pregnant, so I was pretty tired most of the time. Napping was a very big part of my life. One afternoon, I was taking one of those naps, and I woke up with a start because I was so cold. Another cold spot. Dreadfully, I sniffed the air, seeing if it reeked of sulfur or ozone or whatever the hell that smell was, but I didn't smell anything at this point. I slowly got up and looked around. That's when I saw it dart into our bedroom. I could hear the whispers again, but I couldn't make out what it was saying. I started to pray and held the cross that I wear around my neck. It seemed the more I prayed, the colder I got, but I still prayed with one hand on my cross and the other on my belly. I prayed harder and harder and started to smell that sulfur smell. I closed my eyes and prayed more. At this point, the smell was so strong I thought I was going to vomit, and I was shaking because I was so cold. Again, I left the apartment not wanting to be alone, and spent the rest of the day at the library. That night, Josh, the medium, and I did a home blessing and read some Bible verses out loud. We prayed some more and hung up our crosses. This is what seemed to help the most. I felt so much better after the blessing. The medium told me she felt a darkness leave after the blessing. Now I say the prayer of St. Michael every single night. Yet another time, I was taking a shower while Josh was at work. I was at this point on maternity leave, so I spent a lot of time in that apartment, alone, unfortunately. Usually, a pregnant woman is looking forward to her time off. You have the whole nesting thing, movie of the week marathons, lots and lots of naps. Well, most pregnant women aren't being stalked by shadow ghosts like I was. But anyways, I was taking a shower and I saw someone pass by the curtain, plain as day. For a moment, I thought Josh was home early, but as I looked around, there was no one there. Again, I left the apartment and didn't come back until Josh was home. As the end of my pregnancy neared, I started seeing the shadow man more and more often. Maybe it was just because I was home alone more? I don't know. Josh and I decided we should put our money towards renting a house instead of an apartment, and we started looking around. This actually made the activity worse. I felt like it was almost daily that I would see this thing. Usually I'd catch a glimpse of it darting into another room. I'd feel cold spots and smell that ozone all the time. I was not a happy camper at this point. Now I was a week overdue. I was just ready to have this baby and be a mom. And I was seeing this thing all the time, and I was doing all I could to keep my mind off of it. I decided to read my Bible from beginning to end, and this actually gave me comfort, and I felt safer and closer to God. The more I read, the more peaceful I felt. Finally, eight days after I was due, I gave birth to our daughter. I was instantly in love and wanted to do everything in my power to protect her. I was so scared that this thing would go after her that I spent most nights just watching over her. Josh did what he could do to help out and keep watch over her too. It was my duty as a mom to protect this beautiful precious life from this monster that was harassing me. And I was going to find out how to get rid of it once and for all. When Carissa was three months old, we moved into a house on the other side of town. Before we even moved in, we had that house blessed, and we had Carissa baptized. I didn't have an encounter in that house for almost two months. Then the cold spots came back. I stayed up watching Carissa all night. I prayed and prayed for her safety. Josh came in and sat with me, knowing how scared I was. Just leaning on him made me feel better and I managed to fall asleep. I was watching TV as Carissa napped and I saw a reflection of a full-bodied apparition of the Shadow Man walk right behind me, right behind the couch, and it was going towards the kitchen. I leapt off the couch, completely frightened, and raced into the kitchen. The smell of sulfur 
wafted into my nose, and I knew that that thing was back. It seemed like it took a while to find me, but it always does eventually. The encounters continued, over and over. Not so much the long encounters anymore, but there was a lot of the darting into another room going on. And it seemed to particularly like the garage. I've seen it there probably a dozen times at this point. One night, we had some friends over for dinner, and as we were eating, my friend started acting funny, looking around, getting really quiet. Once the two of us were alone, she told me she saw the Shadow Man too. This was the first time someone else had ever encountered it, and I felt guilty for being excited about it, but what else could I do? For so long, I was plagued by this thing and nobody else could catch a glimpse of it, but now my friend saw it too. Unfortunately for me though, she refused to come back over after her encounter, but she did openly talk to me about it, and I was able to share all my experiences with her. Carissa is now almost two. I'm 21 weeks pregnant with our second child and we're still living in the same house. The shadow man still comes and goes. Once I started feeling the cold spots and smell the sulfur, I walk through the house with my rosary and say the prayer of St. Michael for protection. I've been encountering this thing for years now. Just last night, I saw it again, back out in the garage. It was just standing there looking at me. I try not to pay attention to it. I think that if I let it scare me, it gets stronger. So now, I just deal with the damn thing. Sincerely, Katie. In September of 2011, Jeff, Cassie, and their four daughters moved to Potomac, Montana, which is a little town about 30 miles from Missoula. It was a fresh start for all of them, and they were all excited for a change. When they first arrived in Montana, they stayed with a relative until they could find a place of their own. Finally, after a few months, they found a beautiful four-bedroom, two-story house with an attic, basement, and a mudroom, which is a room off the side of the house, like a big laundry room, with a door to the outside that keeps mud from being tracked into the house. To make things even better, this house was just a few houses down from the elementary school where the kids would be attending. The house itself was about a hundred years old, which made it the oldest house still standing in the valley. Needless to say, this house was perfect, and they jumped at the opportunity to rent it for their family. For the first three months, everything was perfect. They loved the house and the open land behind it that they could explore. But soon, things would take a sinister turn. The first incident occurred late one night in the room that their two youngest daughters shared. Gabrielle was four at the time, and Brooklyn was only two. Every night, between 2 and 4 a.m., Gabrielle would wake up, screaming in terror. Cassie and Jeff would find her sitting up in bed, frozen in fear, claiming that someone else was in the room with them. I know Cassie personally, so she recounted this story to me in person. And at this point, when she was talking about the entity that Gabrielle would encounter, she paused. I could see her eyes well up, and the goosebumps rise on her arms. That was just recalling that incident. Imagine how scary it would be to find your tiny child claiming that there was some kind of invisible force in the room with you. At first, Jeff was pretty skeptical of anything supernatural, not just what Brooklyn and Gabrielle were saying, but anything supernatural, and just blamed it on bad dreams. But nonetheless, being the comforting and protective dad that he was, he allowed the little ones to sleep with him and Cassie. During these nights, when Gabrielle would fall asleep in her dad's arms, she wouldn't have any night terrors at all, and would sleep completely through the night. But soon, both of the little girls refused to go back into their rooms under any circumstances, not during the day, and especially not at night. They wouldn't even go in there to get their toys. Cassie and Jeff would have to go in there and get anything that they asked for and Cassie ended up keeping all of their clothes in her room. They even bought mattresses and put them next to the bed so the terrified girls would have somewhere to sleep. During the entire time 
that they stayed in the house the rest of the time after that encounter. Those girls never once went back into that bedroom. But they went about their normal lives, working, spending time together as a family, and eventually they all pushed the events out of their mind until their next encounter. That happened one night when Cassie was sitting in the living room and Jeff was at the fridge getting something to drink. Cassie witnessed a bottle cap fly off the counter on its own and hit Jeff in the back. She screamed at what she just saw, but again Jeff was skeptical and brushed it off as his wife trying to mess with him. He knew she was a believer in these things, but still, he refused to say anything supernatural was happening. She swore to him that she hadn't done it and saw it fly off of the counter with her own two eyes. He quietly tried to think of a logical explanation. Maybe it was a gust of wind coming from their open mudroom door, but Cassie knew that wasn't the reason. Nothing else on that counter moved, including the paper towels lying there. If it was in fact a gust of wind, surely those paper towels would have moved too. It was about two weeks later that their dog Dozer started staring at one specific spot high in the corner of the kitchen. He would bark constantly, always in an aggressive way, always defensive, and would even do bluff charges towards that corner, as if he were trying to attack something that only he could see, or at least sense. I know Dozer myself. Being a vet tech by trade, I've worked with Dozer myself, and never has he ever shown any sign of aggression not even during vaccines or exams. The only time he's ever been defensive is when he felt that the safety of one of his family members was in jeopardy. Soon after that, Cassie started hearing a female voice calling her name. It sounded like it was right in her ear, but she only ever encountered it in the master bedroom and it was always on her right side. She started to pray that whatever was haunting them would just leave them alone Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. Because in the months to come, Cassie fell ill with a serious thyroid problem. The two little girls were constantly sick with pneumonia for 12 months straight. At times, their fevers would spike up to almost 105 degrees. The doctors would blame viruses any time they took them into the hospital, but they could never seem to pinpoint which virus it was or how to stop it from coming back. They even had their house inspected for mold and radon, but nothing was ever found. One day, while Cassie was at work, she received a frantic call from her 13-year-old daughter Isabel, who was babysitting the little ones. She said Gabrielle was burning up with a fever, and her legs were weak. She told Cassie that she needed to get home right away, and Cassie sped home. When she got there, she found Isabel standing in the driveway, holding Gabrielle, who was stripped down and wrapped in a sheet. When Cassie held her daughter, she could feel that she was burning up and had a rash that covered her entire body from head to toe. The rash looked exactly like measles to Cassie. And when they got her to the hospital, she had a fever of 104.9 degrees. Her doctors were baffled and started to bring in other doctors to get their opinions. All they could do was run blood tests which showed nothing. They tested for measles, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, mumps, strep throat, toxic shock, and evil muscle wasting diseases. By the end of the day, they sent her home with Motrin for her fever, but by the next morning, she couldn't even feel her legs. Cassie and Jeff took her right back to the hospital, and she was admitted to the pediatrics ward under complete isolation. Whenever anyone would go into her room, they'd have to be dressed in gowns, gloves, and masks. Everything to keep whatever it was in there that was making Gabrielle sick contained to that room. They ran more blood work, which only showed a sign of elevated white blood cells. Two specialists even came in to examine her, and both had no idea what was wrong. She ended up staying in isolation for two more days until her fever broke and she regained the use of her legs. The morning after that, she was discharged and her rash was completely gone, and she seemed to be back to normal. At this point, Cassie and Jeff discussed moving, thinking that something in the house might be to blame for all the health problems that their family had had. But it seemed like the more they discussed leaving, the worse things became for them. 
Their oldest daughter tried to kill herself. Jeff became extremely depressed. Cassie's health worsened to the point of her having her thyroid removed. And the two little ones were still plagued with their bouts of pneumonia. One day, while Cassie was at work, Isabel called her again. She told her that Brooklyn, who was now three, was talking to somebody who wasn't there. When Cassie got home and asked her about it, Brooklyn said she was talking to a little girl in a dress. This one, though, Cassie just brushed off as her imagination. But a week after this incident, they started hearing noises in the halls and the walls, like scurrying rats or squirrels. They would hear creaks coming from upstairs and even footsteps above them. And the girls were still terrified of their old bedroom. Then, Cassie received another call from Isabel while she was at work. She was concerned that the pipes were frozen because the kitchen faucet was turning on by itself. Cassie asked her to make sure the handle was tight, but Isabel told her, Mom, it's turning to the on position by itself after I turn it off. This was Cassie's breaking point, and she told Isabel to grab the girls and pray for safety. Finally, in June of 2014, after almost three years of paranormal phenomenon, they had enough money saved up to decide to find another place to live. They decided on South Carolina for a fresh start and a warmer climate. But it was around this time that Dozer began to show signs that something was wrong with him too. He got really sick, lost the use of his back legs, and couldn't barely walk anywhere unless he was going after that same spot on the wall in the kitchen. It got so bad that Cassie and Jeff contemplated having him put to sleep if his condition worsened anymore. Finally, in July, Cassie and the girls packed a few bags and left overnight, while Jeff stayed behind with Dozer to pack up the rest of their home. The events that Jeff endured during this time turned a lifelong skeptic into a firm believer. His experiences started each time he would walk up to the second story. He would find himself getting extremely fatigued and out of breath, and describe the sensation of something pulling him back down the stairs, like a physical entity trying to push him down the stairs, or pull him towards it. In the three years that they'd lived in that house, he never experienced anything like that before. Once he went back downstairs, he couldn't feel the presence anymore, but he would still remain extremely fatigued. He'd lie down to rest and be unreachable for hours or even days. He'd call Cassie, distraught, and tell her he passed out and didn't know why. And this would happen every time he went upstairs. It was like something didn't want him to finish packing. He'd get the distinct feeling of being watched, and that someone or something was in the house with him. One day, while he was moving things from their garage, the door from the house to the garage broke off of the hinges and hit him in the head, splitting his head open. During one of the episodes where he couldn't be reached, he woke up with a burning sensation on his chest and found a lit cigarette lying on him. When he regained his senses, he found he had slept for 18 hours straight. Unless something else was to blame, he would have had to wake up light the cigarette, and immediately fall back to sleep for it to have burned him the way that it did. And to add to the mystery, Jeff never once had lit a cigarette in the house, much less smoked one while inside. Now in South Carolina, Cassie found a friend in a psychic and had her bless their new home that they were moving into. The psychic met with Cassie and discussed what was going on in their old home. These were things that Cassie hadn't even mentioned to her. She explained to Cassie that she felt there was a female entity in their Montana home and that it had attached itself to Jeff, claiming him as her own. This psychic believed that this was why Cassie, Dozer, and the kids had so many health problems. Because that entity that attached itself to Jeff wanted them gone. She wanted Jeff alone and to herself. She instructed Cassie to call Jeff and tell him to leave that house now leave anything that wasn't packed, and get the hell out. She was sure that his life and Dozer's were in extreme danger. Cassie called Jeff and told him everything that the psychic had explained to her, 
And to her amazement, he agreed. He said he now believed that something was in the house trying to hurt him and keep him from leaving. He managed to break free and leave the house, leaving everything that wasn't packed behind. Because of all the unexplainable things that happened to him, what should have been a week's worth of packing waylaid Jeff by almost a month. After leaving the house in Montana, Cassie, Jeff, and their family haven't experienced anything unusual. No more faucets turning on and off. The girls can sleep in their own rooms and are completely healthy. Cassie's health issues and Jeff's fatigue episodes have also disappeared, and Dozer even regained the use of his legs and is completely fine. And he also no longer growls at some unseen force stalking his family in the kitchen. About a week after I interviewed Cassie, she came up to me while we were working and said she was contacted by a woman that now lives in their old home. The woman asked if she'd ever experienced anything unusual there and told Cassie about the things that she'd been experiencing since moving into their old home. She and her kids were always sick. Her marriage is in jeopardy and she's seeing and hearing things that she can't explain. Cassie warned her about all the things that she too endured while living there and urged that woman to get her family the hell out of that house before anything else happened to them. In February 2011, Anthony Cheney and five partners were doing security at a dance club in Chico on a Saturday night. After having a rough night dealing with gangs, they were all in the parking lot and watching the last of the patrons leave. Anthony got into his car and headed towards the highway. Five minutes later, he was on the highway heading towards Oroville, an area he had to pass through in order to get to Marysville. It was now around 3 to 3.30 a.m., and Anthony was tired, so he was driving slowly and carefully. While he was on Highway 70, about a mile from Ophir Road, he caught some movement ahead of him on the right side of the highway. He slowed down and leaned in to get a better look. He couldn't believe what he was looking at. He rubbed his eyes in disbelief, hoping he was seeing things because he was tired, but he wasn't seeing things. At this point, Anthony described time as slowing down as he came to a complete stop and took in the details of what stood in front of him. He was staring at a nine to 10 foot tall hairy person standing at the edge of the field and right next to or just behind one of the road signs about 60 feet away from him. Only, this was no person. This huge, hairy creature had a German shepherd or wolf's head with amber-colored eyes and was standing on two legs. Its long arms ended in claws. Anthony estimates that this creature weighed between 600 and 800 pounds. It had dog legs but a man's upper body. It was huge, extremely muscular, and had brown fur with tan and light brown coloration mixed in. To make things more terrifying, this werewolf-like creature was staring right at him. Then, casually, it turned around and faced the field behind it. It took several steps, walking upright like a man. Then, this thing went down on all fours and began running through the field. With his foot on the driver's seat and his arms resting on the top of his car, Anthony watched this thing move. It moved incredibly fast, so fast that he knew he'd be history if that thing wanted to chase him down, and he was happy that it wasn't him that was standing out in the middle of that field. He was in utter disbelief. As far as he knew at this point, he just had an encounter with a werewolf. Once this creature reached the middle of the field, it stopped briefly to turn its head and look at Anthony. That's when he got back into his car and continued to watch this thing. It ran towards the tree line at the back of the field. Behind this field is the Feather River, and just on the other side of that is the Oroville Wildlife Area. This place is a day-use area only, but it does have a small camping area. You have to go through California Highway Patrol to get a permit to camp there, though. It's heavily watched by the CHP and Parks and Recreation so it's people like game wardens that take care of this place. They say it's to protect the wildlife, but who knows, right? All Anthony knew is that this was an encounter with something he had no idea existed. 
Was it an encounter with a werewolf? At least it was something fitting the description of one. In 2012, Anthony's son told him about his own encounter that happened in 2011, just after Anthony's encounter. But he was only 10 feet away from this thing. He lived on Aspen Way in Olivehurst, California at the time, and had stepped out into the garage to do some laundry. There he found his dogs huddled together on the couch. They were shaking and staring at the side door, which was open. Looking over at the door, he was shocked to see a black-furred, werewolf-like beast as it easily climbed over his six-foot fence. As it passed the door, he noticed the black fur, dog legs, and really muscular body. This thing was so tall, he could only see the bottom of its muzzle. This dogman had to be around seven to eight feet tall, and it disappeared into the darkness of his backyard, and then into the field behind his house. But this wasn't the first time his son had witnessed something unnerving. In 2010, he was camped out in his backyard. Just a few feet away from his fence in the backyard is a six-foot ditch. That night, he saw glowing amber eyes, like a dog or cat's when the light hits their eyes just right. Those amber eyes were a foot above the inside of the ditch, making whatever it was that was out there at least seven feet tall. Needless to say, he went back inside and spent the rest of the night inside. In 2009, also in Olivehurst, California, which was about three blocks away from where Anthony's son lived, a husband and wife who wished to remain anonymous had an encounter of their own, which they recently shared with Anthony. One night, the husband observed an eight to nine foot tall dogman with dark fur. He describes this thing as jumping from rooftop to rooftop of his neighbor's homes. He lost sight of it because it went right into a tree. Mr. Smith described the same type of creature that Anthony had, and that his son had. Wolf or German Shepherd head, a buff man's upper body, and dog-like legs. Mrs. Smith was in her bedroom facing her mirror so that she could do her makeup. It was then that she saw that werewolf-like creature looking in through her window. She spun around in fear and disbelief and realized it was looking right at her. She screamed for her husband that family moved. When Anthony asked the woman about her encounter, she was too terrified to describe anything and just said one word. Werewolf. On June 21st, 2015, Anthony wrote a book about his encounter called Kunuiji, Sketches of an Encounter with a Dogman. Kunuiji is a Maidu word from Northern California native tribes that means big, hairy, bigfoot-like creature that lives in the forest and eats human children. <laughs> How do you like that description? If you're interested, it's spelled K-O-H-U-N-E-J-E. -E. He's also working on a new project of two short films and a full-length cinematic feature called Beast in the Fields, recounting his run-in with the Dogman. What's interesting about this one is I know exactly where this is at. I've passed that exact spot where he had watched that dogman move more times than I can even remember. My family and I used to go camping there multiple times every summer. I've probably camped there dozens of times, sometimes even by myself. I've gone hiking out there by myself. But now, hearing this story and knowing what's out there, I don't think I'll be camping out there alone and I definitely won't be hiking out there alone. When I do go out there, when I'm back there in that area, I'm armed because now that I know the truth of what's out there, you're not going to catch me unprepared. And to quote Anthony, you don't just see things like this. I've driven through this area plenty of times, day and night. I just don't go fishing at night anymore, no matter where it's located. I did learn later that other Californians in the area have seen them, some years before my sighting, others after. I'm not the only one that's seen this thing, and maybe one day we'll figure out what the hell they are. I live in Indiana, and I've been raised on a farm my entire life. The town I live in is small, a remote farming area in southern Indiana, in a remote, small, wooded area. The area almost bored me until I was eight, 
Then I got my first gun. Raised on a farm, we were always taught discipline and sacrifice to receive something back. Now I've been hunting since I was eight years old, and have hunted alone for a long time. The reason being is that our woods are just a mile from our farm. At this point, I was on break from school, relaxed because our exams were over and finished with, so I took a day to go hunting. I've helped my grandpa set up deer stands all through our woods two years before this. We decided to do something on our property, and it was a good bonding experience. Only now I think back to when this living nightmare happened to me. Please, from what I'm about to tell you, don't call me out on this encounter. I swear to you, I'm not lying. I've been ridiculed by other people that I have shared this with, and I hope on a channel like this, you guys will believe me. Because those things really are out there. Everything I'm about to tell you is true. The day in question, I went hunting. I made it to the campsite around 6 p.m. I rode there on my dirt bike and chose the northern deer stand for my main use for the night. I set in for the peace and quiet of the forest and started frog gigging, which means hunting frogs with rocks or handcrafted spears. Then I set up my stand and just waited, listening and hoping for a good sized buck to take a sip from the pond below me. I heard a pack of coyotes in the distance. But I wasn't worried, since coyotes are heavily populated in the country. I didn't even think much about it, but I did turn to see if I could catch a glimpse of the pack. I saw them in the distance in the cornfield. Their shadows were moving swiftly. I was pretty amazed at the sight, since it's rare to see a coyote. But as I watched, something just didn't look right. There was a larger figure moving near them on all fours. This stunned me because I was unable to think of anything else that it could be, and I knew that a coyote couldn't be as large as this thing was. The pack started to move closer to the wooded outskirts where my deer stand was. Again, I watched this figure and decided for a fact that this thing was too large to be a coyote, or even a wolf, and this scared me. When it was about 20 or 30 yards away, I could smell this outstandingly disgusting odor that this creature produced. It smelled like old urine mixed with cow crap. I freaked out and slammed the door to my deer stand closed. I don't know if that creature could smell me or if the banging of the door attracted it, but I realized I messed up bad. I looked out of the window and its figure was just... 10 yards away and moving from tree to tree. I could hear its heavy footsteps circling my stand. I grabbed my flashlight to see if this thing was anywhere closer so I could see it and get a good look at it. To this day, I regret grabbing that light. I wish that I never saw that thing because now it haunts every nightmare that I have. I looked out and turned on the flashlight. Standing on its back legs, three yards away, was this jet black, very hairy, wolf-snouted creature looking right at my stand. Of course, it noticed my light, and looked dead at it, holding its hands in front of its face to cover the light. Its eyes haunt me until this very day. They were angry and mean-looking. They were amber in color, but still almost human in intelligence. His hands were human-like with a gray palm. It was pretty large and buff and easily looked like it could weigh 400 pounds and tear me to shreds. As for the height of my stand, I was about 10 feet up. This thing's head was just 2 feet maybe from the bottom of me, so I say that it was about 8 feet tall. I must have frightened it when I shone the light at it because it flew from sight. Maybe these things just don't like to be seen. I jumped back against the wall, realizing what I had just seen. For all intents and purposes, this thing looked just like a werewolf. What happened next, though, is the reason I don't even go into the woods alone or hunt alone anymore. I still have to overcome this memory every time I even look out at our woods because it was just so 
traumatizing. This creature gave off this blood-curdling howling sound. That horrible howling and those shrieking snarls really flooded my memories of being a kid and watching that movie Bad Moon. And then I heard more of those things calling to it in the distance and realized that there is more than one. The howling from the distance sounded differently. If anything, I think this creature was running with another one. The rest of that night, I sat in the corner, my 12 gauge loaded, staring at the door to the stand, waiting for that creature to come out so I could try to get away. That creature howled on and off all night, knowing that I was in there, and I could hear it howling back and forth to the other one, although I never caught a glimpse of it. When morning finally came, I checked all four directions with my binoculars. I saw nothing, but it still took me forever to work up the courage to go down that ladder. For all I know, that thing was lying in wait with its buddy, waiting to tear me apart. I left everything, hopped on my dirt bike, and flew back to the farm. When I got back, I was scolded for lying. My grandpa said I was being immature and senseless. However, he did go hunting a few weeks after. I begged him not to. I almost cried every time he went out there for fear that those creatures would get him. But he always returned. One time though, he came back with this look of absolute shock on his face. He told me he found two full-grown bucks, mutilated, not far from the deer stand that I was at. The scene that he saw told him that it was wolves based on the experiences that he's had out there, but the thing that he couldn't understand was that both of their heads were gone. He told me he's heard howls like I described to him. He's also been in fear like I felt that day. My setting, however, is the only one that was reported in my county, but I did some research in my neighboring counties and found out that the June after my encounter, a man on a roadside cleanup crew was driving around picking up dead animals. He saw a pair of raccoons crossing the street and slowed down. Out of the tree line, a beast that was really well built snatched both of them up and darted off. This guy stated that he was shocked and swore that that thing was walking upright just like when I saw it, and it almost looked completely like a wolf, except for the fact that it walked like a man. I'm now living with my mom in a more populated area of Indiana. I've always dreaded telling this story, in fear that people will think I'm doing it for attention, but I promise you, this is all told out of complete honesty. So I want to tell anybody else out there that feels the way I do about sharing their encounter, that you're not alone. Speak up. Channels like this are made for you to share your story and get the truth out there. Because hundreds of other people have had terrifying experiences like I have. I never saw them again, but like I said, I don't really go out there anymore and I live in a different part of Indiana now. I don't think I'll ever go out there again to be honest because I don't want to run into those creatures again. I'm afraid that if I do, I won't be as lucky. I have quite a few stories to share with you. Most of them are about hauntings and ghosts that I've encountered. I have lived in not one, but two haunted houses. One of them is the house I live in right now. My Nana used to say I was sensitive. I guess she's right since I've seen so much. I'm going to start with the first haunted house I lived in back when I was a kid. That one was the worst of my ghostly encounters. We only lived in the house for eight months, but those eight months really sucked. I'll try to put as much of it in order as I can, but some of the experiences, I can't remember which came first. Some of them I'll just list when I can remember when it happened. It was back in 1993 when I was 12 years old. My mom, brother, and I moved into an old house in Albany after my parents decided to separate. It was really upsetting. It was a difficult time in my life since I always looked up to my dad, but they were always fighting and something just had to give, I guess. Since my dad worked overnights and most weekends, it was decided that my mother would take me and my brother most of the time. 
My brother was 14. Looking back on those experiences of that house, I believe the activity started right away. The very first night, actually. It was a Saturday when we officially moved in, and I stayed up pretty late that night. I was determined to trick out my room and have the next day to try and make new friends. It was actually a desperate attempt to keep my mind off of my parents' struggles, since I was sure they were going to end up getting a complete divorce. Anyways, it was a little after midnight, and I was unpacking a box of movies when I heard a scratching sound coming at my bedroom door. I figured it was just our dog, who was a mutt named Charlie. He heard me and wanted some company. I really didn't want him in my room at the time, since there were so many boxes and stacks of clothes. I didn't want him messing with them, so I just ignored him. The scratching stopped after a few minutes, but it started again not soon after. I finally gave in and opened the door, but there was no Charlie. I figured he just got tired of scratching and went off to go sleep or something. I went back into my room and started unpacking and started hooking up my VCR, but Charlie started scratching again. I went over to the door and opened it. Nothing once again. I thought to myself that maybe it was my brother trying to scare me and wandered down the hall to his room. I silently gave him a nod for being able to run back down the hall without making any noise. His door was shut and I could tell the light was off, but I opened it anyways and looked inside. He was asleep, snoring away. I went to shut the door, but had to do a double take because I swore I could have seen a shadow move in the corner. Now creeped out, I went into the living room, found Charlie and made that dog sleep in my room with me. Unpacking could just wait until the next day. That night, I had a pretty freaky nightmare too. There was a shadow of a person, at least it looked like a person, standing at the foot of my bed. It was silent and didn't move, but it still made me feel really uneasy. There was something seriously off about this shadow guy. It was tall, faceless, blurry, and really, really dark darker than the darkness of my bedroom. When I woke up, it was still dark outside. I hadn't set up my clock radio yet, but I figured I'd only been asleep for a few hours. Me and Charlie slept with the light on the rest of that night. For the next couple of weeks, nothing really happened. The house made some seriously creepy noises. It sounded like footsteps sometimes. It would creak and groan, and those scratches kept happening. My brother said maybe there were rats or squirrels or some other type of vermin in the walls, but I wasn't too sure. My mom said it was just the house settling, but neither of us believed that one. I also had the Shadow Man dream a few more times, but all he ever did was stand at the foot of my bed. About a month after we moved in is when the activity really spiked. My brother really liked to paint. He had one of those easel things in his room, and much of those oil paints and tubes that looked like toothpaste. One day after school, he found the red paint all squeezed out on the floor of his room. The carpet was definitely ruined, and my mom was pissed. She blamed him, he blamed me, we both pled our innocence. He swore it wasn't like that before we went to school, and it's not like that kind of tube could just tip over and pour out. Like I said, it was in a tube like toothpaste, so you would actually have to squeeze it to get it out. My mom still didn't believe that one of us wasn't responsible though, and stormed off to make dinner, saying that we were just covering for each other. Dinner that night was pretty unpleasant. My mom was still furious. Mentioning that I thought the house was haunted didn't help my situation. Now, even though my Nana believed in a lot of stuff, my mom did not. When my brother chimed in, she sighed one of her I'm about to kill both of you sighs and firmly said there were no such thing as ghosts or haunted houses. I really think whatever entity was in that house heard her and thought of that as a challenge. A challenge that that creature accepted. Later that night, the three of us were in the living room with Charlie, who was acting nervous and restless, not much like his lazy self. We heard a shatter come from the kitchen and the three of us ran in there to find a glass cup shattered on the ground. 
a cup that was in a closed cabinet, a cabinet that would have had to have been opened and the cup taken out. Funny thing is though, that cabinet was still shut. My brother made another comment about the house and my mom punished us by making us clean up the mess. While we were there, I swear it looked like a piece of glass shot up and cut my hand open. That incident got me three stitches and tons of ridicule from my brother. I got to spend some time with my dad a few days later and told him about the weird dream I kept having and all of the stuff I thought I was seeing. He didn't exactly believe me either, but he also didn't say it was crazy or full of crap. He just said sometimes your imagination can take over. Heh. <laughs> Not so helpful, Dad. Not so helpful in the slightest. The next incident happened when my brother was home alone one night. He told me he was sitting in the living room watching TV and saw a figure pass behind him through the reflection of the TV. He thought someone had broken into the house, but when he looked around, he couldn't find anything, and all the doors were still latched from the inside. No more than a day or two later, I saw the same damn thing, except it was out of the corner of my eye, not the TV. I was in the bathroom, brushing my teeth before school, and I swear someone, or something, passed right across the doorway. It scared me so bad, I started gagging on the toothpaste that was in my mouth. I told my brother what I saw, and he looked so relieved that I thought he was going to cry. I asked him why he was so happy I saw something too, and he just said that it confirmed that he wasn't crazy, and that there was something in our house. One night, the three of us were in the living room again, watching TV, and we heard someone walking around in the kitchen. My mom was so scared that she actually called my dad and told him that someone was in the house. He came over to inspect the house and found nothing, naturally. I pointed out that all the doors were still locked when my dad arrived. This was the first time that my mom looked like she might not be so sure of her theory anymore. I think then was when she was starting to think that maybe me and my brother were actually right and that there was something in the house. This was also right around the time that Charlie started acting weird. He would always stare into space, but he'd act like he was staring at something standing in front of him. Then he'd start to growl, run off, and repeat the process. We took him to the vet to see if there was anything wrong with him since he was only six years old. He had a clean bill of health. The vet couldn't explain why he was acting so weird. And it wasn't like he was only doing it at one spot in the house. There were times he'd be in my room and do it, or in the kitchen, or in the living room, or even my brother's room. A couple times he was even in the garage when he did it. The weird stuff continued to happen. Nothing too frightening, but things like batteries dying all the time. More creaks and weird noises. Charlie kept doing his weird routine, and there were more scratching noises. I had that shadow man dream a couple more times too. My friends all thought it was cool when I told them. I thought it was scary. They wanted to come experience something. I preferred to stay at their houses. It got to the point that I was always nervous. I was scared that I would see or hear something else. I wasn't sleeping good, I always felt sick, and I always had the feeling that something bad was going to happen. When I stayed at my dad's or my nana's or a friend's, I never felt like that, but as soon as I'd come home, it would start all over again. I started staying with my dad whenever I could. I could tell he was really worried about me, but also happy to have me around him. I could also tell he really missed my mom, which didn't make me feel any better. I didn't understand why they couldn't just work things out and we could move out of that stupid house. One day while my brother was washing the dishes, another glass moved on its own and shattered in the sink. It cut his hand and he ended up getting stitches too. This was when we both started begging my mom to find another place for us to live, but she refused. I thought that meant she was back to not believing us, but on one of my restless nights I heard her crying in the living room and talking on the phone to Nana about how scared she was for my brother and me. This is when things get a little fuzzy and I can't remember which of these happened first, so now I'll just list the experiences until I get to a point where I remember the timeline. 
Once, when my mom was alone in the house because my brother and I were spending the night with our dad, she says that Charlie was lying on the floor in the living room while she was balancing her checkbook, and he jumped straight in the air, yelping in pain. She tried to calm him down, but he was just as confused as she was, and the poor little guy was shaking. He kept licking at his side and whimpering. My mom checked him out for any wounds and looked around the carpet for maybe a spider or a bee or something, but she couldn't find anything. They went back to the vet, and again, they couldn't find anything wrong with him. About five or six months after the paint incident, the same thing happened again. My brother came home and found his paint squeezed from the bottle onto the floor again. To make it even worse, it was once again the red paint. My brother and I both saw someone walk across the kitchen from the TV reflection at the same time. We looked at each other, asking if we saw the same thing, and we confirmed to each other that we did. We got the nerve to go up and look, not even expecting to find anyone. Not shocked, we found no one there, and no trace that anything had ever been there anyway. On several different occasions, and never at the same time, except for once, all three of us heard whispering noises at night. I could never really make out what they were saying, but my brother swears he heard a voice say his name more than once, and he heard a voice say either, leave or please but he couldn't figure out which one. It felt like the longer we stayed, the worse the nerves got and the feeling of dread was. For about a month and a half before we actually left the house, all three of us were constantly sick. My mom always had headaches and would get short of breath. The doctors couldn't figure out what was going on with her. Her blood work was fine. She even had x-rays and nothing was abnormal. My brother and I would get extremely anxious and have increased heart rates. These symptoms happened all times of the day. They were never triggered by any paranormal event or anything like that. It happened to me once while I was taking a shower and listening to the radio. For once I wasn't even thinking about what was going on with my life. It happened to my brother once while he was studying for a test in his bedroom. Towards the end of our time there and maybe even one of the main reasons we ended up leaving entirely was one night when I was sleeping and Charlie was in my room. I woke up to him snarling and barking at my door like he was protecting me. I've never, ever seen him act like that before, and I never saw him act like that the rest of his life. I clicked on the light, terrified that this was it, and saw how my dog was reacting to whatever was on the other side of the door. His hair was standing up, his teeth were bared. He looked like he was waiting to pounce on whoever walked through that door. The only thing I could think to do was call for my mom and brother, so I started yelling at the top of my lungs. If I wasn't so damn scared that night, I could almost look back on the reactions and laugh. My brother was the first one in. He was holding a baseball bat. He was quickly followed by my mom, who was in her nightshirt and brandishing a wine bottle. My heroes. As soon as they burst in, Charlie started wagging his stumpy tail and was back to his old self. I hysterically told them what happened and once again my mom relied on my dad to come save the day. After that, I didn't stay at that house much at all. Neither did my brother. If my dad had the night off, we stayed with him. If he worked, we stayed with Nana. I remember begging my mom to come with us every single night. I didn't want her in that house alone, but she never came with us. She always said that she'd be fine. I guess she was wrong. One morning, while I was staying with Nana and my brother was at his friend's house, my dad called and said we were moving out of that house and staying with Nana until we figured things out. My mind was racing. Why was he telling me and not my mom? I asked him if she was okay, and he was quiet for a moment before he said, I think she'll be okay. I asked him what happened, and all he said was, she saw it. It took months of prying and getting yelled at by my mom, dad, and Nana to drop the subject, but my brother and I finally got the story from my mom. She was getting ready for bed and saw something move out of the corner of her eye. When she spun around to see what it was, 
she saw a full-bodied apparition of a shadow as it moved out of the bedroom and down the hall. My dad helped us pack everything up, and we never looked back at that house. My mom didn't even care that we lost the cleaning deposit because of all that stupid paint. We ended up staying with Nana for a little over a month until my parents decided to work things out and we all got to live together again. They're still together to this day. Not that that part matters to my story, but I just thought I should end it on a happy note. A few years ago, I went back to that house out of curiosity to see if the people living in it were having anything happen, but the house was vacant. So that's my first haunted house story. The house I'm living in now is haunted, I'm sure of it, but nothing bad or scary like that ever happens. I think this one is more mischievous than it is hostile. I'll share that story and my others at a later time. Thank you for putting me on your channel. Until next time, Brad.